Well, it is good to be here. It's good to see each and every one of you guys today. It's good to be at Real Life in Galleon, Ohio today. What a wonderful day it is. We can worship together, praise together, love Jesus together, hear from God together, spend some time together. The Advent season today is uh, in full effect, and our sermon for today is on peace. And at about 9.45 today, we discovered that ProPresenter, which is what runs this screen, uh, decided to have a nationwide, uh, nationwide collapse. So on Peace Sunday, I'm up there scrambling to try to get everything together and sort it out. We fixed it. I think it ran great for the song. So good job to the guys up in the sound and uh, video booth uh, and there's, yeah, nothing like a sermon on peace to give you, to, to, to welcome that sermon with zero peace this morning. So, good morning. I want to start this morning, I'm going to talk about prophecy and peace, both of those two things. And I want to lay the, prof- the, the, the groundwork for what prophecy is and help our understanding of that. So, Bill, if you could pull up, there's a, there's a slide that says Qumran 1. If you could pull up that picture for me. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So, in 1947 and through uh, to 1956, an amazing gift was given to Christianity and the world. Prior to 1947, the oldest version of the Bible we had was a, a document called the Codex Sinaiticus. And I won't get into the, the finer points of that, but that document was written in 400 A.D. 400 A.D., let's do some quick math. That's 400 years after the birth of Christ. So prior to 1947, that's what we had. The Codex Sinaiticus, there was a few other versions, but the earliest version was that from the 4th century, 400 years after Christ. However, in 1947, an amazing thing happened that changed, I don't know, it's it's a wonderful thing. Again, a gift to Christianity and the world. This cave in Qumran, which sets... Uh, right next to the Dead Sea, these are the, the, the cliffs and hills that run right next to the Dead Sea. And that little tiny dot where that red arrow is shining is a, is a cave. And in that cave, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we've probably all loosely heard of. It was a, a massive treasure trove of biblical artifacts, books, uh, there was cloth documents, there was papyrus, there was all of these, these ancient manuscripts that they discovered. In that cave right there, Cave 1, they found a document that's titled scientifically 1QISA. And that means that it came from Cave 1 in Qumran. And it's what they call the Great Isaiah Scroll. The Great Isaiah Scroll. If you go to the next slide, it's a picture of this scroll. There it is. This is a portion of it. And what this is, this is the entire book of Isaiah. What makes the Great Isaiah Scroll incredibly unique is that it's one of the few things that came out of that cave. That's the entire book. It was rolled up. That's what a scroll is. But they've laid it out. It's digitized. You can go to a couple of museums that have copies of it, but they have the original uh, hid away safely. But they have the entire book of Isaiah in one scroll. And that's, I mean, you can see there's a few little damaged pieces, but by and large, one scroll. The great Isaiah scroll. Now what's super interesting about this is that in 1994 and 1995, The University of Arizona here in the United States tested about 30 different things that were from the the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of them being a piece of the great Isaiah Scroll. And when they tested it, they, B.C. And B.C., we know what that means, 
before Christ. So prior to that, the Codex Sinaiticus, 400 A.D. after Christ, 125 to 150 B.C. before Christ, is the great Isaiah scroll. Now what's so interesting about that? Because 150 B.C. is before the birth of Christ. Paraphrasing the Strong's dictionary definition for what prophecy is. It's something that God gives us that can reprove us, rebuke us, encourage us, teach us, but it typically happens before, not after. It's really easy to tell you the score of the football games from last week. It's really hard to tell you the football scores for today that haven't happened yet. It's a poor example for what prophecy is, but bear with me in that short example. The idea is it happened before. So when we read the book of Isaiah, that's still in our Bible today, it was written, so the, the, the scholarly consensus based on the data, the names, Isaiah was probably originally written around 700 BC, but the copy that we have that was found in that cave and that that picture is of right there is from 100 years, 150 years before Jesus. So when we read Isaiah, it was written before Jesus was born. The book of Isaiah has at minimum 125 different prophecies about Jesus that were fulfilled in his lifetime. 125, 150 years before. When you read the book of Isaiah, you're reading a book that was written before Jesus was born. And I know it's before, if we flip through the Bible, it's before Matthew. But I just love that fact, that there, this, this scroll, the testings from it, what they found... It's just an additional piece of verifiable evidence that Jesus Christ is king. That he was born and that when we read Isaiah, we see the prophetic. I was telling Melissa this yesterday and she's like, I'm going to have to read Isaiah again. <laughs> Every time we see a prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah, it was a prophecy. It was before, well before So we know what prophecy is now. Now, secondarily, I want to talk about peace this morning. And these two themes are going to be uh, the cornerstone of my message today. Peace. What is peace? And I heard that Bert talked about it in Sunday school today. So we'll see if I step on her message or she steps on mine. What is peace? The biblical usages for peace... Uh, the main usages of peace in the Bible typically is going to refer to one of four things. There's a few others, but the main things, peace between nations or national peace, which apparently I haven't read the news yet, but that sounds like good news. I'll take Pastor Trevor's word for it. There's hopefully some national peace that's going to start happening over there in Syria. The peace between each other, and Will's not here, so I'll pick on him. When me and Will are fighting and disagreeing, tussling back and forth, when we're at peace, we're not fighting. The third kind of peace would be like the peace that we can feel on the inside, that God brings us. And then fourthly, uh, would be the peace, and I call this a salvific peace. It's a peace between us and God. So mainly when we see the word peace, it's going to refer to one of those four things typically. The first point or the first thing I want to talk about this morning, I want to read Isaiah 9 and 6, which Bert already read, and she probably read in her class back there too. Isaiah 9 and 6 for unto us a 
child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name is called, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We're going to be talking about the Prince of Peace part. Spoiler alert. The Prince of Peace. 700 years before when Isaiah was originally written, it was foretold that a Prince of Peace was coming. That a Prince of Peace would be here. And 700 years later, that prophecy was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. Peace was promised by the Father. Prince of Peace. This child that would be born would be the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Now, I already went over what peace was, but as far as that Prince part, that means authority, royal authority, that he would have power. That, that's, that's signifying regalness. It's signifying royal authority. Jesus would be the Prince of Peace. I want to read another prophecy uh, from Isaiah 59 and 16. He saw that there was no man... And wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation. I picked a couple of prophecies because there are so many. This prophecy, I'll read it, the last, last line of that. Then his own arm brought him salvation. In John 6 and 40, it says this, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should receive eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. There is eternal life in Jesus, or as Isaiah said, salvation would be brought by his own arm. Do we get that? The salvation was brought by his own arm. Jesus brought that salvation. That prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus. Another amazing thing, written 700 years before Jesus was born. We see this verse saying that salvation was going to be brought by Jesus' own arm. He was going to bring it himself. There is eternal life in Jesus. The Father promised the Prince of Peace would be born, and that Prince was Jesus. The peace that he brought was the rescue from the power and the effects of sin in our lives. What is salvation? Salvation is the rescue from the power of sin and its effects in our lives. And Jesus brought that. Jesus brought that. That that, that peace that would restore, that would, that would not make us mad at God or God mad at us. So peace was promised by the Father. When Jesus was born and in his ministry, we see that Jesus, that peace was portrayed in Jesus or was fulfilled in Jesus. It was shown in Jesus. The very first thing, when Pastor Trevor said, your topic is peace. Very first thing that popped into my head, Mark chapter 4, where Jesus is in the bottom of the boat, and the disciples are on the deck of the boat, and there's a crazy storm outside. The wind's blowing. It says the water's coming over the sides of the ship. The disciples are very worried, and that's a reasonable reaction. No shade to the disciples. Jesus is in the bottom of the boat. What is Jesus doing? Somebody help me out. What's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. Yes. Jesus is in the bottom of the boat, asleep in the storm. The disciples are upstairs freaking out. What is, they wake Jesus up. He comes up and what does Jesus say? Help me out again. 
peace be still. First thing I thought of, peace be still. Was peace portrayed in Jesus? Yes, yes, and yes. That was the very first thing I thought of. And as I was thinking about it in relation to this sermon, I'm like, how can I include that in there? It's such a wonderful story. And I think about that at times. Jesus stilled the peace. He said, peace be still. The very words of Jesus was able to calm a ridiculously crazy storm. As I was preparing this one evening this past week, I think it was Thursday evening, outside it was howling wind, just terrifying. When I looked outside, it's like white, just covered in snow. And I was just, I'm literally preparing this, I'm thinking about it, I'm praying about it, and I look out and I, I hear that wind and I see that white sheet of anything that I can't see through. And I just think of Jesus saying, peace be still, and just cutting it out right then and there. And he has the power to do that. He did it then. How awesome would it have been to see that? And then I thought about it, and I'm like, man, how often have I had an inner storm? Had I had something inside of my spirit that wasn't right, and the peace of God was able to calm the storm inside of me? I have a friend who, quite a few years ago, uh, lost her son. That's one of the worst things that can happen, you know, the, the death of a child. Uh, that is one of the worst things. As a parent myself, I fear that greatly. Her son passed away. And... I can't begin to imagine the amount of pain that that would cause. And she went to the, uh, the, the church that I used to go to, and I remember there, I mean, I, it was, this was probably maybe 10 years ago, I don't recall exactly, but I was there, and she was having a very hard time. And we brought her to the front of the church, and we prayed for her, that there would be, that she would, that peace would somehow find her. And I remember several weeks later, she stood up in church and testified that at the funeral of her son, that she, at the funeral, the, the, the meal afterwards, the entire process and everything that follows that, and she stood up in church and testified that at the funeral, the whole process, she said, I just felt peace. And she started crying, and you know, I, God, amen, I get it, I'm there. And she said, it's like a peace that I don't understand, that didn't make sense, that shouldn't have happened. She still hurt, she still felt pain, but there was a peace. And she said that that peace gave her the strength to make it through that. I hope all I have to do is hear that testimony. I hope I never have to live it. I hope I never have to see it. But there's a peace that passes all understandings. That storm inside of us that, can, that we can have peace in our lives in is a peace that Jesus brought. Amen and hallelujah, that peace is still here for us today. Isaiah 62, uh, I'm sorry, 26 and 3, it's another prophecy. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. This is the peace that quiets our hearts and truly does not make sense. The peace of God that passes all understanding doesn't make sense. It hits us when, when we're going through it, when life isn't, when things are bad, and somehow... We can get up, and we can do the things we need to do, and we feel a peace inside of us. When we shouldn't have it, that's the kind of peace that Jesus can bring. He, and, and you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you.
we got to keep our minds right. We got to keep our minds set on him. I'm thankful today for the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Because if you don't need it today, and your life is great, and you have no problems, you don't need a peace that passes all understanding, amen. I'm happy for you. But when you do need it, it will be there. And if you're going through the storm, I'm sorry, and I will pray for you. Let me know I will pray for you. I want to read one more, well, two more sections of Scripture. This is Isaiah 44 and 3, another prophecy. Peace was promised by the Father. It was fulfilled or portrayed in Jesus. It was reflected in Jesus. And peace was then provided by the Spirit. Isaiah 44 and 3. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. I will pour my spirit on your descendants. What does that sound like? Back in Isaiah. It sounds like Acts chapter 2. It sounds like all the times Jesus was like, hey, I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send my spirit to be with you. It blows my mind that these things were talked about 150 years, at least before Jesus' birth. I love it. I love it. Peace was provided by the Spirit. The Spirit was poured out, and peace comes through that. The next section I'm going to read, and we should have it on the screen, John 14. This was the second portion of Scripture that I thought about. John chapter... 14, verse 16. John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The spirit of truth that they're referring to is the Holy Spirit. Jesus was giving them notice of what was going to happen. See, Jesus, while he was there, he was with them. He dwells with you. But... The Spirit will be in you. Jesus told his disciples a couple times that he was going to go away. He's going to go back to the Father and that his Spirit would be poured out. His Spirit would then be with him in his absence. As Jesus now stands on the throne of heaven, his Spirit, the Spirit of God, is now here with us. And that Spirit provides peace. Okay, we'll continue on. 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And again, this is the words of Jesus. I just love this imagery. God will not leave us as orphans. I love it when God refers to us as kids. And it's super cool that he says orphans. Because that means that we are not a spiritual being. We are a physical being. And he's like, hey, you're not a part of my family, but I will bring you in. And I think about this too, as orphans, they don't have a mom or dad. They don't have people to take care of them typically. And here God is saying, I'm not going to leave you like that. I'm going to adopt you into my family. I won't leave you as orphans. That's what he's saying. And I think about this as a, as a parent, myself now, in my advanced age, how many times my kids come to me? And they're like, Dad, we need this. Or how many times they come to that lady right there? Mom, 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 mom. 
it's already happened probably 50 times today where our children have came to us needing something. I love that imagery because we're the kids in this story going to God. Like, God, I need you, God, I need you. Every hour I need you. (laughs) What I also love about that is I think about how desperately lost my kids would be without me. Lincoln, as smart as he is, and he's a smart kid, if he's by himself, he won't last very long. He needs his parents in his life. Man, without God, I wouldn't be here today. And that's just what it is. Not just physically here, but gone. I need him so much. I am thankful today that I am not an orphan, but that God loved me so much. He says, I'm not going to leave you like orphans, but I'm going to bring you in. And I'm going to be your father. And that's, maybe we call him our heavenly father. I'm so grateful today for that, that we can reach out to God as our father. And not just as a bad father or a bad dad, because I know everybody didn't have a good dad, but as the perfect father. I'd be lost without him. I'll keep reading in verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I will live, because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you While I am still with you. But the Helper, the Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Again, I love the language here. The promised Holy Spirit is our Helper. I need help today. I need help every day. The Spirit of God the helper, the comforter, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Musicians, y'all can come back up. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Amen. Amen. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. It's not any like anything you've ever gotten before. The world can't give us salvation. The world can't give us a peace inside of us. Unlike anything the world can do, our God can do. Our God will do. Our God has done. Our God is doing. It's not like the world gives. It's like God gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We need that peace today. We need that peace today. 
whether we need the rescue from the power and the effects of sin in our lives, or whether we need a peace that passes all understanding to, 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 to be inside of us and, and get us through our day. Whatever that peace is, it was promised by the Father, portrayed in Jesus, and then provided by the Spirit. God is so great. I'm thankful that he indeed is the Prince of Peace. Our Heavenly Father is the Prince of Peace, prophesied, lived, and then gave us that peace. His Spirit's here with us today. As we were singing earlier, good job, guys. Good job for the singers today. I was feeling the presence of God, the power of God. I loved the songs. They were great. Man, it's good to be in church today. Sing with us, worship with us as we sing one last song, praising, worshiping God. What peace you need today, you can find in Jesus. Amen. You can stand with us this morning. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here the atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. The atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here overflow in this place Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit of God, Oh, fresh on us, we need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit of God, oh, fresh on us, we your 
kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love. Surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love. Your love surrounds us. Josiah talked about his great age. As a young father, I can talk about my age as an older father. And I would like to share this with you today. First of all, I want to say thank you to all who turned out yesterday. My understanding from Amanda, that was the biggest turnout we've ever had for help with the Christmas parade in town. There was lots and lots of us there to uh, give out candy and to have the testimony of a trailer with a manger scene, thanks to all of our kids, and to all the hard, hard work that Josiah and a bunch of others of you, Mark driving the truck and all of us who came out. So thank you. I think we should have pictures of that up on our website uh, in the coming days. So I want you to take a look at, at who was involved and who was there for that. But I will just say this. I've learned over my years that the greatest messages that have impacted my life from a pulpit have been when I have taken what I've heard and put it into practice. I have learned that it is in the doing of your faith, in the doing of your love, in the doing of offering peace to others that your peace is increased and that the world benefits from what you do in Christ's love for others. It is, in fact, in the going and in the doing that all the things you hear from this platform increases within your heart and within your life. So the blessing today, based on this good message from Josiah, is a very simple one. Let's close our eyes. Father, help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. Help us to take the peace you have given us and the joy and the hope that accompany that. Help us to take that out into the world. 
and help us to be those who bring peace through our testimony, our love, our witness to those who do not yet know your peace, which passes all understanding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace and give peace this week. In Jesus' name, amen.